Father, Lord, thank you tonight that we can come, God. Thank you that we are here and it's uh, dry in here, God. It's been kind of a rainy couple of days. And Lord, I pray you just uh, send us showers of blessings, God, uh, Lord, tonight and help us to, uh, um, uh, God, to worship you. And, and Lord, um, God, hear your word and God, I pray you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. Well, um, I got a letter from the Robinsons in Chile. Amen. Um, they're starting phase three, uh, and uh, looks like things are good to move to phase four, which is a, a procedural and legal reopening in Chile, but they're still in phase three. So um, they're not sure if this is going to happen, uh, especially if COVID makes another wave through their uh, which it has once other one other time. Um, anyway, he's trying to get something done. He says anything done. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, uh, so going back to the beginning of the month, I had just written to you that I had been diagnosed with the COVID flu. Thank you very much for all your prayers and encouraging communication. The day after sending out the letter, the Chilean health ministry remanded me quite involuntarily to a government-run sanitary residence. So he was locked up in a house to complete my 10-day quarantine where I was sequestered in a private room from which I was not allowed to leave at all. Yeah, he was locked up for any reason whatsoever, nor was anyone allowed in, obviously, until the 10 days were revealed. I guess someone slid some food under his door, I, I would hope. <laughs> Anyway, he spent the time reading a large portion of the Bible and other works, and uh, he'd been meaning to get around to for years. Uh, as far as the flu experience itself, uh, other than the five days of unusual f fatigue I told you about, I had no other symptoms at all. So well, that's a blessing. And so um, anyway, now he's getting back to his uh, reestablishing his route uh, to pass out tracks and do things downtown. And uh, pray for a guy named Jose um, that he witnessed to. And uh, let's uh, just uh, pray for the rest of the people at the church that they stay healthy. And uh, so we need to remember Brother in Chile. Uh, boy, I got a letter from Brother Lee. It's been a while since we had one from Brother Lee. Um, he uh, says, despite having lockdowns again, we are, had a very full and profitable couple of months. Um, he had the privilege of seeing a 92-year-old woman 
uh, named uh, Glacepia receive uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. A couple weeks later, she was gathered to the Lord and I preached a funeral, which was attended by her Catholic family. It was a little hostile, but the Lord gave me necessary boldness. Please pray for the salvation of the Bruno family. The seed has been planted. And so uh, there are several other Catholic families here. Um, he's uh, he's uh, uh, trying to finish translating his hymn book. Um, he finished it as well with my soul and when I survey uh, the cross. He, he's uh, made uh, uh, kind of friends with a guy named David uh, who works at a publishing house. Uh, he visited the church a handful of times. He likes the hymn translation and is helping us with the legalities of printing the first edition of a hymnal. Lord willing, it will contain some 50 hymns and about 20 uh, traditional Italian hymns. Pray that the Lord will guide us to make the right decisions concerning this project. Uh, aside from the Bible, one of the most important things a missionary can get is a hymnal in the language of the people. And uh, the Italians really haven't had anything in their language as far as biblical Christianity since uh, nearly the time of Christ. Um, and most of those people were persecuted. So let's uh, pray for Brother Lee. Let's uh, remember Miss Marcia tonight. And uh, how's Miss Carol doing? Okay. Uh, do they have any idea when she's going to get out of rehab or anything? Or are they just going to keep her there till? Oh, that's a standard. The, uh, that's yeah. The standard. Okay. Okay. So tomorrow will be a week, so probably next Friday. Okay. And then she'll come home or hopefully. Yeah, okay. Amen. Well, that's home. <laughs> All right. We're going to try to learn a new song tonight, which is actually a very old song. Um, this was written by Fanny Crosby in 1877. And you've probably never heard it. It used to be the number one printed song, number one in most revival hymn books of the day. And they would sing this song either as the first congregational song or the piano would be playing the song as people came into the tent or auditorium. Now, we don't much understand this nowadays. Uh, and some of you that weren't other than Baptists, you may not understand it either. But the Lutherans, when you came into the service at a Lutheran church, you were very quiet. You did not talk. You did not joke. When you, when you entered the auditorium doors, you shut up. And you sat there very quiet and you prayed and you listened to the music and you tried to get ready for the services. Well, that was a very common practice in 1877. And she wrote this song. Uh, the other title for it is called Moments of Prayer. And uh, I, have a, I have a thing I listen to on the internet. Um, this is sung by a Welsh choir on the recording that I have that I listen to all the time. And um, I decided to pull up the words. And I said, you know, modern Baptists need to have this in their heart when they come to church. Uh, even if you don't know how to sing it, you should feel this way. So, Linda, why don't you play it through? Oh, you brave self. And do the best you can. First verse for you. I've never seen this before tonight. <laughs> Jesus! 
us our dearest friend while at thy feet we bend oh let thy smile descend tis he we see let's sing on the first here from the world we turn jesus to see here may his loving voice tenderly speak jesus our dearest friend while at thy feet we bend oh let thy smile descend tis thee we seek oh um, Oh, let's get that again. Come, holy comforter, presence divine, now in our longing heart, graciously shine. Oh, for thy mighty power, oh, for a blessed shower, filling the Hallowed are with joy divine. Savior, thy word revive. Here may we see those who are dead in sin, quickened by thee. Come to our hearts tonight. Take every burden light, cheer up our waiting sight, we long for thee. That's a good song right there. Amen. Go ahead and keep those and put them in your Bibles and stuff. All right, we're done. You through with me? I'm done. Would you... Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Tonight we're going to look at verse number 11. Just one verse. Verse number 11. The Bible says, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Till the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. And Lord, we're looking for your coming. That's not what Isaiah was looking for. But now, now we get to look for something a little different. And then people will start to look for this. Help us, God. Sometimes we wait, and you make us wait. And God, it's very common for us to say this to you, Lord, how long? So help us to study this subject tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the book of Isaiah was written during a relatively good time in the nation of Israel's life, but toward the end of Isaiah's life, King Manassas came into uh, kingship, and he was an evil king. Now later he repented and got right with God after God uh, beat the snot out of him. Uh, but I don't want to be like that. I, I want to get right with God, stay right with God. And uh, so Isaiah... Uh, he saw all kinds of things. In the first part of Isaiah, until chapter 40, God has all kinds of things to say to Israel. Some of it is not very savory. But, um, you know, I'm sure like a lot of people, God made Isaiah wait at times. Um, you know, sometimes God will answer your prayer quickly. Uh, then other times, He will make you wait. Uh, what's hard to wait about now is that we, like Isaiah... Um, 
we're living in a country that's going away from God. Now, that doesn't happen toward way later in Isaiah's life, but it's been happening my whole life and your whole life that our nation has slowly been slipping away from the dock that is God and going out to sea. And it makes it extremely difficult when everything is nice and everybody's going to church and we, we have a quote-unquote Christian nation and there's morality and, you know, certain evil things are still against the law. It, it, can be, uh, it can be okay to wait for a while as a Christian. But when everything is going to pot around you, it is hard to wait, folks. Because you want to say, Lord, how long is this going to How long is it going to be? How long am I going to have to put up with this? And, and God, God understands when you say that to him. He really does. Uh, if he didn't, he would have backhanded old Isaiah, but he didn't. He, he, he answered him. And God will answer you, too. There's three things I, I want to note about waiting tonight. First of all, sometimes we wait on communication with God. Sometimes God will take a break from... Um, Communication. I mean, there'll be some mornings you'll open the Bible and it's just like God is pouring out the, the instruction from the scriptures on you and he's talking directly to you from the pages of the Bible. Then there's other mornings you get up and you look at the Bible and it's just like it's laying there flat. But that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. That doesn't mean God isn't interested in communicating with you. For some reason or another, God is making you wait on something. Now, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, uh, it, it talks about um, wisdom. And it talks about those that hear wisdom. And in verse 34 of Proverbs 8, it says, Blessed is the man that heareth me. Sometimes God knows our heart better than we do. I think sometimes God takes a pause at communicating with us because sometimes we're not ready to hear what he has to say. And so God takes a pause. But he says, blessed is that man that heareth me. If you can hear God and listen to what he's got to say, you're blessed. But notice, watching daily at my gate. You're never going to communicate with God unless you have a regular habit of listening for him. Waiting at the post of my door, for whoso findeth me findeth life, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And shall obtain favor of the Lord. I want God's favor, don't you? Well, there's three things. We've got to hear God. Hearing God. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. God says, look, he put out the book. Sometimes it behooves us to search for the answers rather than wait for God to show us something in the book. As a preacher, I know this. Sometimes God will just drop a sermon right on me. He'll give me the, the points, the subpoints, and even some of the illustrations, man. At other points, I have to get that Bible out and I have to study this and study that and study this. And it's like digging, digging a 10 foot trench. And by the time I get done, I'm tired because I worked hard on that sermon. But when I get up in the pulpit, God assures me that, yeah, this is what I want you to say. Uh, you know how that goes. I mean, you mothers, uh, you know, is it easier to feed kids some days than others? <laughs> some days you have to work harder at it. Oh, Mom, I'm tired of hot dogs. Mom, Mom, I want macaroni and cheese. I don't want, I don't want this. What I, you know, I don't like peas. You know, you know how it goes. Well, that's the way it is with God. Sometimes he'll hand you broccoli or something you don't like. And he wants us, he wants us to eat it anyway. Hear it anyway. And not only do you hear God, but you must keep busy. There must be daily activity. Now, I like uh, all these missionaries here lately. I don't think we have a lazy missionary among any of our missionaries. They all keep busy. That's my kind of person. Uh, people that just sit around all the time, well, they 
you know, uh, God's not interested in folks like that. He wants somebody who's going to be busy for him. And he knows if you're busy in your things, he'll, you'll be busy in his things. Generally, that's true. Psalm 86, 3 says, Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Now, the activity that the psalmist is doing every day is he's crying to the Lord. And that's one of our daily activities is praying to God. Praying to God. And if we hear God and we pray to God, we will find God's favor. Psalm 119, 58, I entreated thy favor with my whole heart, be merciful unto me according to thy word. God's favor. God's favor. Now, we have all kinds of communication nowadays. We have these things called cell phones. And I will tell you a secret. A cell phone is nothing but a radio. To, oh, no. It's just, no, it's a radio. It's an electronic radio. It's a radio that's packed full of electronics. But let's face it, folks. You take a signal out. You get a signal in. It's got to go through the air to some antenna. Then it's got to go through that tower to another tower to another tower. It is a relay radio. And that's all that it ever was. And that's all that it ever is. And um, they had those going back a long time. If you ever watch one of these old black and white movies and you see some guy with a, a phone in his car, that was a radio phone, okay? Uh, we just got them smaller. And let's face it, with all electronics, computers, it'll do a lot more than a radio phone will. But radio uh, really goes way back. Um, there was a fellow named Maxwell uh, back in the 18... Uh, uh, actually, he was in the 1860s, and he came up with the, the theory of uh, electromagnetism going through the air. See, they had invented the telegraph, which is basically an electromagnet, and when you touch it through a wire, the other end of it touches, and you can send signals with it, da 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 And his theory was is those electrical ma magnetic waves, he called them, would be able to go through the air if you did it just right. And so he postulated this theory. So all kinds of people jumped on the bandwagon. And uh, you got this uh, guy in 1880 named David Hughes. Um, he studied Maxwell. And he started trying to prove that Maxwell was right. And uh, then there was another guy came along. His name was Heinrich Hertz. You ever heard of a, a Hertz? Well... If you, if you dial a radio, you will dial in hertz. It's megahertz or gigahertz. And that's who it was named after. He devised an experiment to prove that you could broadcast electromagnetic waves through the air. And thus, technically, he sort of invented the basis of radio. But, of course, you couldn't talk with anybody. You couldn't really send any messages because it was one big static pulse. That's the first radio signal. It was just, everybody just, ooh, listen to that. You know, if we went back in time, we heard that, we said, well, so it's static. You know, I, get, I get that on my radio all the time, you know, between channels. Um, but many people worked on it. Edison, Tesla, Bose, a guy named Lodge, Popoff. Uh, Einstein even uh, thought about it in some of his theories. And uh, many people tinkered with it and tinkered with it. Um, Marconi was the first man who commercially made a radio that worked and he was able to sell it to people. Of course, many claim that Tesla came up with it and Marconi stole it. And there's some good evidence that, that might be true. Um, but later on, Tesla beat them all. He, he was the first one to put the radio wave to work. So what did he do? Well, he made a radio-controlled boat so that it had a little propeller, the little radio wave made the motor come on, and then the little radio wave, uh, this little thing he designed, it made the rudder go this and that so he could, he could make this little toy boat go through the water. Well, there's radio-controlled toys and all kinds of things. But, uh, see, that's the way it is with God. you got to learn how to communicate with God. And then God can put you to work. 
But God wants to control what you do. So sometimes we have to wait on our communication with him, just, just like radio had to wait. Then secondly, we wait on serving God. We wait on God. Uh, now, when we say wait on God, some people don't understand what they're saying. If you go to a restaurant and you have a waiter come and he waits on you, that's what's going on with God and us. We're waiting on God as waiters. We're serving God. We're doing His will. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1 through 5 says, Finally, my brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that ye may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Well, we got a lot of those running around. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your heart unto the love of God and unto the patient waiting for Christ. Now, I want you to notice three things from Thessalonians there. There's working with the word. Paul took the word and he worked with the word. And when you work for God, it's got to have something to do with this book. Whether it's preaching or Sunday school teaching or printing tracts or printing Bibles or translating hymn books or, or getting out there and passing out tracts or, or, or bringing folks to church so they can hear the preaching of the Word of God. It's got something to do with the Word of God. The church, its main thing is the Word of God. Without the Word of God, what do you got? Not much. You got a social club where everybody comes in and sings. Well, you can go down to the glee club and then college and do that. Romans 12, 7 says, Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. So those two things you do with the Word of God, just as an example in Romans 12. And then you have to work reasonably. The Bible talks about unreasonable men. Well, we should never be unreasonable. You said, have you met unreasonable Christians? Oh yeah, I've met Christians who were reasonable one time and then unreasonable the next time. Uh, sometimes it's easy to be unreasonable. When, when uh, people come to their family, sometimes they're unreasonable. Uh, sometimes when it comes to their wealth, they become unreasonable. Sometimes when it comes to them personally, they become unreasonable. Other times they're perfectly reasonable, all three of those things. But no matter what we are, God wants us to be reasonable. In other words, we have to think the right way. We have to feel the right way about it. Psalm 123 verse 2 says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hands of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Now it's talking about waiting on God like a servant waiting on the master. And look, you, 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 uh, uh, you wait till you see the master's hand. You know, like, come here, I want something from you, or, or go, or, uh, you know, a lot of times masters don't have to give you a command with their voice. You watch what they tell you to do with their hands sometimes. But, but it's all reasonable. You know what to do. You know your place, you know your job, you know how to do it. All that's reasonable. And when we serve God, we have to... That's why I'm not against Christian education. That's why I think preachers ought to go to school. So they learn how to do what they're supposed to do. You ought to learn how to teach, brother, somehow or another. Uh, and it's easy to learn how to teach. Being a father, you naturally learn how to teach. But, you know, if you can go further, go further. Um, so how did you learn? By doing it. By doing it. <laughs> Brother Bill ain't around no more, but uh, he could tell stories about the first time that, that I was let loose at Florida Town Baptist Church in the Sunday school. I did all kinds of weird things. Those people were not ready for me. Um, <laughs> 
I come up to the office after Sunday school, and there was a couple of the other teachers in there, and I could hear Brother Bill saying, Now look, just because he doesn't do it the way you do it, don't criticize the boy. And I just stood there at the door and kind of laughed. I said, Well, I guess I messed up somehow or another. And later on, I talked to Brother Bill, and he said, Boy, you really screwed up. I said, Yeah, I heard. <laughs> He said, what'd you do? And I told him what I did. He said, yeah, that wasn't really the smartest thing to do. <laughs> but you learn how to do things and what not to do. But you had to do reasonable. And he said, well, why do you work? Why do you wait on the Lord? Because you love the Lord. You love the Lord. If you don't love the Lord, don't serve Him. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. We serve God because we love Him. We love Him. Waiting on the Lord. Have you ever heard the uh, expression is like paint drying? It's like watching paint drying. You ever heard that expression? I decided to do a little research on how long does it take paint to actually dry. Um, according to Wikipedia, oil-based paint takes six to eight hours to dry the touch. Okay? Uh, that's not in Florida. <laughs> in Florida, you can add about three hours to either, either end of that one. But I didn't know this. It takes up to seven days to cure completely. That means it's going to get as dry as it's ever going to get. Water-based paint, again, this is probably not Florida, takes 30 minutes to three hours to dry. And surprisingly, still takes seven days to cure, which I thought was interesting. Uh, that, that, they got that from the spraypaintersguide.com. Okay, that's where that information came from, uh, off of a page off of Wikipedia. Um, another thing that takes a long time to make is cheese. You ever, you ever eat cheese? I like cheese. American cheese takes two to three months to make. Didn't know that. Swiss cheese, American Swiss cheese, takes three to four months. Um, real Swiss cheese takes over six months, sometimes a year to make. Uh, Astiago cheese, one of them fancy cheeses, takes over 18 months to make. Brie cheese takes three to six weeks. It's kind of a runny cheese. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Uh, cheddar, now this is interesting. Cheddar cheese, which is where American cheese kind of, kind of comes off of, but it can take up to seven years to make. I didn't know that. That's a long time to make a hunk of cheese, man. Uh, I think Kraft must have a faster way because there's not as expensive as imported cheddar from Cheddar England. So, sometimes we have to wait on the Lord, and sometimes doing the Lord's work is like watching paint dry and is like making cheese. It takes a while to get the results you want. So, we wait on communicating with God, we wait on God. And of course, you had to know I'd bring this up. We're waiting on the Jesus' is coming. Say, you about mention that every week so far here. Well, yeah, because I believe he's going to break through the clouds real soon, folks. We need to be ready for him. Romans 8, 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians 1 7. So that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's the groaning of creation. And that includes you and me. Uh, getting old is no fun. Being sick is no fun. Um. Sometimes I get very aggravated at some of the TV commercials that I see. You know, they show all these uh, supposedly senior citizens. They're probably young people with wigs on. You know, they're just jocking along and they're just doing it. And I'm thinking to myself, those people ain't old. They ain't old. 
If they was old like me, they wouldn't be doing that. Uh, yeah, I realize there's some old people that are still spry, as they call it. But I, I don't, I, you go to Walmart, I don't see very many of them. Man, they're walking through that place, you know, uh, and, and they're taking it kind of slow. A lot of them have canes, a lot of them have walkers. You go up to the medical center clinic and you go into certain doctor's offices and that's all you see in there. And they're not running around the block or playing volleyball or, you know, out with their kids, you know, flowing frisbees or whatever like you see on TV. They groan. They groan. And the older you get, the more you groan. Groan. But if you're going to groan, you have to try to keep a good attitude. You say, oh, Brother Jeff, how do you do that? It's very hard some days. Some days it's easier than others. Colossians 4, verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward them which are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech all be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You know, even though we groan and we, we complain a little bit because we're old and creaky, uh, so they're old and creaky, sometimes we, we have to work on our attitude, but, but we need to present a good attitude toward the lost. And they say, how you doing? Don't, don't say, oh, my back and my arm. <laughs> say, well, praise God and just walk on. That's the best you can do. Groaning. I don't know why, but groaning reminds me of chili peppers. <laughs> I'm not a real big chili pepper fan, okay? Mainly because they're hot and they burn my tongue. Uh, some people like that stuff. I don't understand. But uh, the main thing that concerns me about peppers is, uh, did you know that they have a scale to measure the intensity of peppers? Um, it's called the Scoville heat unit scale. And um, you can measure anything from a habanero to a jalapeno to a bell pepper, okay? Um, and uh, how it works is, is Dr. Schofield, he has nothing to do with the Schofield Bible, by the way, uh, or Schofield, actually spelled different, it's S-C-O-V-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, but I, every time I hear a purple pronounce it, it sounds like Schofield, but a Schofield is what it looks like to me, or Schofield. Um... Anyway, he, what he did was he developed this scale uh, measuring, uh, he, put, he would put a, a hot pepper in somebody's mouth and then he would add drops of sugar syrup on the tongue and when the, the uh, taster of the pepper could no longer feel the burn of the pepper, then that's where he would scale the pepper. And it goes from zero to... Um, 350,000 units. A bell pepper is like zero. Uh, Mexico green chili is between zero and 7,000. 70,000. Boy, 70,000. A jalapeno is between uh, 3,500 uh, to 10,000. A cayenne pepper is between 30 and 50,000. A pre pre, whatever that is. Uh, or pre I pre I, I never you pronounce it, uh, is 50,000 to 100,000. A habanero, a scotch bonnet, and a bird's eye are between 100 and 350,000 Scoville heat units. My goodness, who would want to eat that? I do not know. Do you still have a tongue or any taste buds that are still alive <laughs> after one of them? I met a preacher up in Pennsylvania, and that's all he did is sit at his table and he had his big tub of peppers, and he'd just eat them. The whole time I was there, he's eating peppers. I don't think there was a moment I was visiting with a guy who wasn't eating a lot of pepper. And finally, I asked him, I said, brother, you have any taste buds left? And he laughed and said, well, they're not that bad. I said, I think I'll pass, though. Um, anyway, there's there's all kinds of, it, it has a notable hot peppers on the on the website i won't go through all those but um 
you got to be careful of peppers because uh, we're just human, amen? And they will make you groan. They will make you groan. Life, life's like a hot pepper. It'll make you groan. Uh, but you know what? While we wait for God, He'll give us gifts. He'll give us gifts. Um, that verse in Colossians talked about uh, God uh, giving us the gift of wisdom and, and knowing how to answer every man. Now, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, that, that comes from God. And there's all kinds of other gifts that God will give us. We need to use them wisely. And I want to say we're going home soon. Uh, we're going home soon. Luke 19, Jesus told his disciples, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Our job before going home was to occupy before he comes. Matthew 25, in conclusion, verse 19 says, After a long time, the Lord of the throne, uh, the Lord of the those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. God's going to reckon with us one day. I want to be ready for that day. You say, Oh Lord, how long? Well, I don't know. Did you hear the words of that song? Here from the world we turn. Jesus to seek. Here may his loving voice tenderly speak. Jesus our dearest friend. While at thy feet we bend. Oh let thy smile descend. Tis thee we seek. Savior thy work revive. Here we may see. Those who are dead in sin, quickened by the oh, wouldn't that be a blessing? Come to our hearts tonight. Make every burden light. Cheer thou our waiting sight. We long for thee. We long for thee. This song was apparently written to accompany moments of prayer at the beginning of a gospel meeting or revival meeting. It is, of course, to be hoped the congregants weren't ignoring the Lord before this and living worldly lives. But there is, even in the godly life, a sense there are times when we need to turn from the daily routine and pressures of life to meet the Lord in a special and more focused way. Wait. I say wait on the Lord. Oh, Lord, how long? Well, only he knows. I hope you can take this song home and be a blessing. And don't forget, the next time the Lord makes you wait, that he has his reasons and there's things we can learn while we're waiting. Don't get put out with God for making you wait. Just be as patient as you can. Heavenly Father, help us. As we have our prayer meeting, God, I wish you'd come tonight. God, I know there's things I'd love to do. I, 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 God, um, I just started a couple new books, studying them, and God, I'm getting ready for another Sunday school section. And Lord, uh, there's other things I'd love to do if I had the time. But God, mostly I don't have the time to do some of the things I've, I've wanted to do for years. But Lord, uh, one of the things I'd love to see, no matter what I've got going on or what I'd like to do, is you come back. Because no matter what it is, Lord, it can't be as wonderful as the time we're going to spend in heaven with you. In a sinless, holy place with a holy God and a holy body. With the holy angels for all eternity. God, please. How long, Lord? How long? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.